Hi. Oh. Hi, guys. Welcome. Um, we're really excited uh, about the next topic where we talk about impact in startups. And what used to be maybe a checkbox exercise for Swedish pension, pension funds uh, or something for just for panels and, uh, and long discussions has really become front and center for employees, entrepreneurs, clients, uh, LPs, everyone. And so it's great that we're sitting here with, uh, with two people who have been working on this topic from before it became trendy like crypto and AI. So <laughs> we have real people here who can really tell you something that, uh, that matters uh, on the topic. And uh, yeah, we'll do a round of introductions. I'll briefly introduce myself. I uh, started as an entrepreneur long ago and have been a VC for, for 12 years. So lived through two crises, uh, which is very helpful right now. Um, I'm with Norzone. We're a large global uh, venture fund just raised a billion, so we have a, a lot of dry powder to, uh, to go after the current market. And in our portfolio, we see both companies really formatted around impact, like an Eidovan that's trying to uh, stop cardiac attack in the world, uh, or an Einright that wants to electrify all the fleets, but also big companies like our Personio, who have raised 100 million for impact, uh, and Forto that is sort of trying to do uh, sustainable credits for, for ocean freight. So the topic is really uh, front and center in a lot of, of the things we do. Uh, Willemijn, how about you? Oh, I have a very big, different background than Michiel. So I started out from the impact side. I founded an NGO called War Child at the age of 23. And um, <laughs> that was a scale up because we grew to 900 people in 13 countries working with a million kids. So uh, it was an amazing ride. And I stepped out, I'm still on the board, but I stepped out because I believe innovation is what really, what we need to create impact. And NGOs are not the best actors to create innovation. So I wanted to move to the venture space to find innovative models that are scalable and sustainable. So I first built the Dutch Social Enterprise Network, which is like an ecosystem for entrepreneurs on a mission and how to help them scale and grow. And as part of their mission, it was access to capital. And um, then I built with an amazing team of experienced VCs, because I needed them on board, of course. We built Ruby of Impact Ventures, which is a Dutch venture fund investing in impact and, and really taking impact seriously in every step of the investment process. And I'm sure we'll get to that. Definitely. And Emma, you are very well known here to the crowd. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, of course. Uh, so my name is Emma Lehikoinen. I'm the COO at uh, Swapi. Uh, and my journey with startups actually started here at Slush. I was a Slush volunteer uh, for the first time in 2015. Uh, so that's really my first uh, touch to the startup world and kind of how I became super intrigued about the topic that uh, how startups can create impact uh, to the world. Um, but uh, flash forward. Uh, I was doing Slush for several years, president of Slush, uh, and then um, back in uh, 20, early 2020, uh, I joined Swapi. Uh, and Swapi uh, is a company uh, that uh, whose mis mission is to make refurbished uh, mainstream. So we've started with uh, consumer electronics, started with iPhones. We basically um, buy, repair, and sell uh, refurbished uh, iPhones. Amazing, and I'm sure there's a lot of customers here in the audience. And I if hope not, so. <laughs> shame on you. Um, so, from president of Slush, in my perception, you then have a perspective on all kind of startups in Europe. Mm -hmm. What made you pick Swappy? Mm -hmm. um, back when I left uh, Slush and I was thinking kind of what I want to do next, I met our, our co-founders, uh, Sami and Yiri, and I felt super inspired what they uh, were building with, with Swapi. Uh, I felt like it was such a unique uh, opportunity to join a company, was uh, kind of in the hyper growth journey, but with a purpose that actually matters. Uh, and that's how I joined the team. And uh, three years later, <laughs> still, still here. That's great. So um there was, of course, always this whole social uh, investing that existed, but you're probably one of the new, the first of the new generation of impact ventures that also believe that they want to make a real return. Can you tell me a little bit about the early days of how to get it off the ground and how hard or easy was it to get that story across? Oh, yeah. Um, 
I think I mean, for, for me it was very evident that we needed to make market rate returns because if you want to get mainstream capital to flow to impact, you have to prove that impact is a flywheel for success and impact is not a cost factor. So for me it was evident we really need to prove that companies that are excellent at creating financial returns and impact, those are the rock stars of the future and that's what we need to focus on. Um, but it was definitely, when we started this, a, a, a field where that was being frowned upon. You know, you know, how do you, if you found these entrepreneurs, can you actually exit them? Who's going to want to buy them? And um, so I think the market has changed in those years. And uh, we see that there's a big demand for, especially strategic buyers that want to get into these, find the innovation and, and, and get these young, uh, impact-driven entrepreneurs um, uh, integrated, but I think for us it was a, getting the first LPs in was kind of the, the early believers, but now we see mainstream LPs coming in, and, and for us it was really important that impact is not a greenwashing thing, that impact, impact is equally important to returns, which meant that we really had to find a way of measuring impact in yep. an equal way to measuring financial returns, because how can you be successful in both if you only measure risk and return? So if you want to measure risk, return, and impact, you need to quantify impact, and um, we found a way to do that, and that took quite some time to get that um, strong and, and, and um, objective. Because if we set our own impact targets and, we, and then, then we perform well, then we could set them very low and always be very successful. This, that, <laughs> that's, of course, what many funds are doing. And I think if you set targets, for me, for one, this target has to be decided by the entrepreneur, right? The impact comes from the heart or the mission or the activism of the entrepreneur. And so you need to catch what he or she wants to prove. So what is it that he or she wants to change in the world? What's their theory of change? And how can you measure that in one, maximum two KPIs? And then the entrepreneur must still like to report on that, just like reporting on, on, on finance. And then we, as a fund, we use those targets to link our performance 100% to our carry. And we have a carry linked to impact and return. And we need to make both to be able to receive any carry. So for me, that's the way to really structure it in the entire process and make sure that if we're successful, we need to be successful in market rate returns and quantifiable impact. That's uh, very impressive. <laughs> well, how do you, and how do you do that actual measuring? Um, it is, when it's like climate tech, uh, it's not that complex, right? When we talk about CO2, there's a lot out there. And, but if we talk about what I call people tech, when it's about uh, education of children or when it's about well-being, mental well-being, it becomes quite difficult because it's not about numbers. It's about uh, whether people feel that they've actually improved their quality of life. Mm -hmm. And um, so those things are very hard to measure. So it's kind of qualitative measurements that we need to find ways to do. But so, and sometimes, of course, we, we get it wrong, we invest early stage, so uh, the, the business pivots three times and then uh, you took the wrong measure, so that happens. But the es essential is that you find a measure that really inspires the entrepreneur, that he really or she really wants to prove, and then together we, we can figure it out. And it, it's like building the plane while flying, and, and, and we have a couple of impact funds across Europe that we kind of share our knowledge with, and, and also our fuck-ups, because of course we, we did some stuff that really didn't work as well. But in the end, it is possible. I mean, people that say that impact cannot be measured are wrong. It can be measured, it can be done, but it takes work, and it is extra time in your, in your due diligence and investment process. And with your group of, of early funds, is this sort of your proprietary sauce and makes you special and you keep it to yourselves? No, Or is no this way. something you would share with the world? No, no. So my mission in this is I want all of you here, all the investors, by the way, and entrepreneurs as well, to move into impact. So whatever we can do to make this mainstream, we need to share and, and, and how to measure impact open source. I, can, I talk about this a lot <laughs> on different stages, but I would really love to share, but I think a lot of people find it a lot of work, and the, the big confusion is people are confusing ESG and impact. Mm -hmm. So now we have all these SVR, Article 9, and then people think they're impact. For me, that's ESG, and that's just cover your ass, right? It's just do no <laughs> harm. And yep. if you want to measure impact, is how are you bringing actually positive additionality, positive value to solving a societal problem? And, um, and I would hope, I don't think every entrepreneur has to have that mission, but if you have it, try to measure it, because this is also what inspires your clients and, and, and your consumers and your staff. So it's possible. Great. And I won't go more into detail. Yeah, yeah, we'll, <laughs> Maybe, we'll definitely, but now we I, talk to Emma. <laughs> I think Emma can explain how she does it, so, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but let's start a little bit on sort of how did Swappy get, uh, get started? 
Yes, I think it's a great, absolutely great story. Mm -hmm. So um, Swapi was started in 2016 by our, our co-founder Sami and Yiri, and um, they were serial entrepreneurs back then already. Uh, and uh, actually, Sami got scammed when he was uh, purchasing um, used uh, iPhone out of like this online marketplace. And they started to uh, look into the market, and they realized that actually, like only about 5% of the, of the entire smartphone market was used as smartphones back then, like yep. a super tiny portion of the market. Um, and the barrier, like kind of keeping uh, consumers from purchasing um, secondhand electronics was not that they would not like the proposition, like it's more affordable, it's more sustainable, that's great. But they did not trust the product and they did not um, trust the way to purchase the phones. So that's how Swabi was started. Uh, the idea was that uh, we repair everything ourselves. That's how we can keep the quality standards high and yep. we can really make sure that the quality is what consumers are expecting. Uh, and also we've kind of crafted the purchasing experience um, so that it's as close as possible to purchasing a new phone uh, ex with extensive warranty and great customer care. So how do we create this uh, product and service um, that would uh, make that kind of switch from consumers to really consider uh, refurbished instead yep. of new one. Uh, and I think uh, we've done a um, pretty great job so far, although we are very early on the journey, I have to, have to say still. Um, but back, uh, as I said, back when, back when we started, it was about 5% of the market. Nowadays, it's uh, somewhere around 10% uh, of the market. Um, and growing super super fast as well. And if you take, uh, take, uh, like, um, take industries like the car industry, for example, yep. uh, it's 50% of the market. So this mm -hmm. category can really grow huge. That's amazing. And do you consider yourselves more just a tech company mm -hmm. or more an impact company? I or is that a, the wrong distinction? Mm -hmm. I would say that we are a impact-driven or mission-driven tech company. Um, I don't see that it's kind of either or. And how does that translate? How do you measure your impact? We just heard from Millamine that that's really important. Mm. Uh, we've actually just uh, published our first environmental impact report. Uh, so how we measure impact is we take the carbon footprint of a new device and then carbon footprint of a swappy de device and look at the look at the kind of saving that you can do as a consumer yep. um, when you're switching from new to uh, refurbished. Uh, and the numbers are pretty great. Uh, you can save 78% uh, of carbon emissions by um, choosing uh, refurbished instead of new. Uh, and how we uh, like measure our impact as a company is that um, we measure how much uh, savings can we help our customers to, or like CO2 savings can we help our customers to make by offering this uh, product, taking, taking a very conservative estimate on how many people are purchasing refurbished for the first time. Uh, and basically, that's our uh, that's our handprint as the comp uh, as a company. And how much is cool. that in, in total? Yes. Uh, so last year it was about uh, uh, 23 and a half thousand tons of CO2. And for someone dumb like me, what does that equate to? Yes. Uh, so that would be uh, about, um, let's say, like 5,000 uh, cars uh, driving for a year. That's amazing. And I, I can imagine there's more impact in there, because in these new phones, these value chains are very, very, um, uh, there's a lot of human rights issues in the values changed. Children working in mines in Congo to get yeah. materials in phones. So you're, you're actually also skipping all of that. So it'd be beautiful to mm. also kind of mm. measure that, but maybe. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, we're at the kind of very early. You're hired. Early. <laughs> it's uh, very kind of early on our sustainability journey as well. So when we did this report, we wanted to start somewhere, me measure the CO2 emissions. Uh, but you're absolutely right. right. For example, the uh, e waste is the fastest growing waste stream globally. Okay. And we need to do something about it. It, uh, and we need these solutions, uh, for example, refurbishing a smartphone and other electronics uh, to be able to extend the life cycle of those products uh, so that we need to kind of source these rare m minerals or rare, rare ma materials uh, less and less. Cool. And obviously being a mission-driven company uh, has a big impact on the people working for you. How is that at Swapi and what do you guys do 
to sort of promote that? Yeah. Uh, I'm always kind of uh, surprised how amazing team we've been able to recruit. Uh, and I think kind of early on on Swapi's journey, we've had access to kind of people that I would say maybe not all um, kind of earlier stage startups have, uh, because the mission uh, has been something that the people who've decided to join us yep. um, have related to. And uh, it is something that they want to work with every day. Um, so I think uh, that is really the big, big, powerful competitive advantage for mission dream companies uh, that you talent. are able to yeah. attract talent that connect with the mission very early on with, from these kind of uh, um, global tech companies uh, that most uh, startups kind of dream of uh, hiring. Uh, and what do you do to keep that sort of alive? Because on the one mm -hmm. hand, the overall mission is great and you measure the, the CO2 uh, mm -hmm. savings, but mm -hmm. what else do you do to, uh, to make that tangible for people? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it's, it's like, um, it's very, very uh, important to like kind of uh, foster the culture that you have in the company. Like we are kind of very people first or people driven company. And uh, we want to uh, really uh, focus on that. Uh, so it's really not about like you, can t like, you can talk about like the impact you make, but then day to day, it's really about kind of what kind of culture you have at the, at the uh, company. Uh, and that's really kind of to retain uh, the talent. Great. I think it's often very much about authenticity of the mm -hmm. drive. If the authenticity of the founder is really felt in the company, people can feel it as a driver in the culture of what they're achieving together. So yeah, yeah, it's not something so. you can kind of parachute in. And if we look, because the other big sort of lever here, uh, of course, is your customers who obviously kind of like a, a mission kind of driven uh, approach. In the companies you're working with, Willemijn, do you have some good examples why they are winning because of their customer proposal? Yeah, I think the ones that are able to really make a convincing story of why the customer should want to join the mission, one of them, for instance, is Tony Ciccoloni, Dutch chocolate company, makes lovely chocolate, but I mean, you can buy lovely chocolate of any brand. Their mission is to eradicate slavery from the, uh, from the plantations in, in especially West Africa, which is where most of these kids are put to work. Um, and so that's their mission, and they have sourcing principles, but they are very, very clear that so even if you open the chocolate bar, it is unequally divided. There's no squares, but there's unequal. So to really understand and make the consumer understand it's an unfair value chain, and if you're buying this chocolate, you're actually helping solve that problem and that brand has grown incredibly f fast even though they're more expensive than their competitors so you're paying a premium um, because it is more expensive to really make sure the farmers get enough money to actually hire staff instead of putting their kids to work or putting other kids to work so it, it's extra cost in the value chain but the consumers have taken this on massively and 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 the company is growing worldwide this moment and has been the biggest in the netherlands six years after, their, um, That's great. after they found it. So that was really a fast, consumer-driven success. Great. And the flip side of all of this, because you can have a great mission, et cetera, now that Impact is so popular, I remember four years ago, I couldn't get uh, a business plan on my desk, and it said AI somewhere in the, in the business plan. <laughs> now with Impact, you see something similar. And so there's a lot of greenwashing uh, out there yeah. as well. Do you guys have some examples? Oh, there's, I mean, there's so many of them. I mean, it, it, it's ridiculous. I think the funniest example is BP that changed their name from British Petroleum to Beyond Petroleum <laughs> and then had to change it back because nobody kind of accepted that. <laughs> but I mean, looking from the, I'm a Dutchie, so look at Shell. I mean, they're amazing Volkswagen that puts bogus uh, uh, um, systems to. So there's so many examples on, on big scale, on small scale. And, and it's a big problem because people will no longer believe that impact is real as everybody starts using the word. McDonald's creating impact with their, their reusable plastic you know, paper straws that then tend out not to be recyclable at all and then still make the claim. So there's, there's, there's so many examples and I think it hurts the, the movement because you need, the consumer needs to understand that it's authentic. And um, so um, that's, I think, a, a challenge you have to overcome. And the authenticity, I mean, people do, there's so much transparency now in the market, so we hope consumers will take the effort to dive a bit deeper mm. under and these and kind of... And check on Twitter and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess 
in order for the snowball to keep rolling, we need a lot of people here in the audience to build amazing companies or in the companies they're already building, put an element of, of impact into it. What, mm -hmm. what kind of recommendation would you give people that are starting today? Yeah. Uh, I really love to encourage kind of young entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs who are just starting out that uh, they look at the kind of uh, impact uh, first or impact driven uh, companies as an, as an option to, uh, to start from. Uh, I think uh, it's really important that uh, you put kind of sustainability or the impact at the center of your business model. It's harder to kind of sprinkle that on, on, on top. Yep. Um, but also at the same time, I think kind of, I don't see the distinction between uh, kind of impact companies and tech companies uh, so big. Like for example, us, uh, the day to day, we're, we're building e-commerce, we're building the operations, we are hiring talent, uh, uh, we're doing uh, marketing, Thing. Uh, and these are lessons that um, whether uh, if you're an uh, impact entrepreneur, you can kind of uh, take from both other impact entrepreneurs, but yep. also every like tech entrepreneur that has, has been successful. Great. And what segments do you see kind of taking off right now, Willeman? What is From what an is, impact. From so, an impact perspective. So, um, let me first reverse the question to you. Which ones do you see? Because you're an investor, yeah. you're getting every... An ambitious entrepreneur will end up at North Zone at some point. What do you see happening? <laughs> I saw first of a wave, a long wave of people doing carbon accounting. And obviously the first time you see it, you're like, oh wow, we really need that. And then after 72, you're like, maybe we don't need 72. Um, <laughs> What I, what I find really encouraging is that there's real room for technical innovation. So we're seeing smart energy plans, some of them purely based on software and calculations, some of really kind of innovative new materials. Uh, we're, we're seeing material sciences kind of picking up. We see image recognition play a, a large role in a, in a number of fields. Uh, and I like the fact that it's not just on the sustainable end of, of the spectrum, but we're seeing on the people side, access to markets, access to, to education, uh, take off, which I, uh, which I, uh, I find very encouraging. But yeah, what I find, about you? I, I find that last part is, but that's a personal passion, right? I see it happening in every segment, but I'm personally passionate about people. So I love the fact that with EdTech, we can actually reach kids in parts of the world that have not have access to any kind of education or talented people in Africa that get access to jobs internationally that they never used to have access to. So I'm really excited about the opportunities we can create to really get people out of poverty and into development through EdTech. But also, I mean, one of the major issues now is mental well-being, not just among people. I think 50% of people within companies have mental problems. The, the mental problems since COVID in schools are on the rise over the board. So the amount of tech solutions and bringing mental health solutions closer to, uh, to individuals and really using tech to try and, and battle that kind of epidemic that's... Uh, reaching us all, I think is very important. So I, I really try to look from, from where I would love to see the innovation take place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I think always a good question uh, to, yeah. to uh, an investor is that sort of you look at one of these amazing business plans and are you then enthusiastic about it because you think it will work or because you really want it to work? Yeah, now of course, I think as an, as an investor, you want to make sure that it will work. And as an investor, I mean, we know exactly in every impact area where we would like to invest. So which, where we believe the largest impact can be made. So we know what we're targeting. But we come across a lot of entrepreneurs who are activists, and I love it. But some of them are really uh, believers in wanting a, a radical change to happen. Yep. And that doesn't always mean they have the means in the business model to make it happen. But, so, and, but as with impact entrepreneurs, as with any entrepreneur, nine out of 10 fails, which is fine. Because yeah. so, they need to dream big, otherwise yeah. it's, uh, it doesn't work. Um, and there's so many issues that we need to solve yet, so let's come up with these unreasonable ideas and, and let's hope we get some of them to really scale. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're, we're talking about saying, hey, you can do something really good and be financially successful and, you know, for the reasons of, of having great employees and customers caring about, build a really big business. But what now if you build a really big business, if Swapi is super successful, and all of a sudden you can sell the company and you can sell it 
for two billion to someone who really believes in your dream and your mission, or for five billion to Amazon because they think it's a really good model. Mm. What do you do? Yeah, I think kind of uh, when choosing any company kind of to partner with, uh, I don't think it's uh, super black and white that there's this, let's say, impact companies and then there's these evil companies. But <laughs> it's really about kind of how can, uh, for example, we as, uh, at Swapi, we can uh, like uh, establish our mission that is making refurbish mainstream. Uh, so it's really not just kind of working together with the impact companies, but um, it is taking everyone on the ride. Uh, we have so little time left to solve this issue, so we really need everyone. Uh, so like, uh, I think from a very practical standpoint, like, uh, would partnering with someone uh, mean that we can actually make more impact and scale mm -hmm. further, um, and so on. But that's the win-win. Mm. <laughs> That is a win-win, and that's an easy answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's, How do I you mean, guys it, think it about It is a that discussion we've had a lot, right? It's a question we get a lot from LPs, so what happens? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For one, you gotta inv we only invest in aligned models where the growth of the company leads to growth of impact, because otherwise this becomes very complex. Second, we will only invest if the company really puts their impact mission in their deeds of incorporation, which means, and also in their shareholders agreement, so all these shareholders need to agree, whether they're impact investors or not, that this is relevant, and this is going to be part of the exit conversation. Doesn't mean it's the only part of the conversation, but it has to be part of the conversation. And then, of course, I mean, we're minority investors, so the entrepreneur needs to decide where they want to go. But, and then it is actually never black and white, but if the choice is between a company that will pay half and, and a company will pay double that, but you know in that company that they will just kind of try to crush you because you're <laughs> trying to, uh, you know, you're trying Disrupt because their, business. their yeah. business model is uh, might lose out to you. So that would be a reason not to do it. We've never come across that, so we've always been in the win-win up till now, but it's a difficult discussion, but it's a discussion that is really important to have with the entrepreneur, even when you invest. So where do you want to exit? Where do you want to land up? And make sure as an investor that you help them land to that next yeah. step. To and the right place. <laughs> yeah. um, we, we don't have much time left, but let's talk about now we're facing a recession or we're in the middle of a recession. Um, does that mean anything different for impact companies? Uh, is there special superpowers that can help you go through it? Or are you facing the same weather as everyone else? Mm -hmm. I think uh, kind of uh, everyone is feeling kind of what's happening right now, but I think companies that uh, first of all have a product that really resonates with uh, customers, uh, whether it's businesses, uh, consumers, etc., uh, those will be the companies that will thrive also next year. Uh, so, for example, uh, for us, uh, our product is not uh, only about sustainability, uh, but it's really about uh, affordability uh, as well. So we, we think that uh, kind of uh, uh, if we take the long term, long term view, uh, people will still be interested in purchasing more affordable and more sustainable uh, smartphones. Yeah, I think it's, it's the same for any entrepreneur. I think, for, for instance, the ones that are in, in, in climate tech solutions, they will not have, the, most of them don't have a lot of problem. They will actually grow faster. And this, because this, the, the urge for these solutions to grow to scale is much larger now. So there's a lot of opportunity for those. But then for others, it, it's more difficult. I mean, the ones that are dependent on a high electricity bills for the production they are there. I mean, so that's the same for any entrepreneur. Um, and I think from a venture, uh, from an investor perspective, I see a lot of opportunities. I mean, we're in there for the long run. I don't think we'll be doing a lot of big exits next year. So, <laughs> but I think uh, what we are intend, what we intend to do is really create value in the long term and create amazing returns. And I believe these companies have that value and, and we will be able to prove it after this crisis. And as you said, you started this session with you've been through two crises yep. as an investor. There's so light how at would the you answer the, the question? <laughs> no, exactly. It's, uh, it's, you have to do the right things now and then there is light at the end of the tunnel. And um, I'd much rather be in a nimble startup that can really take all the actions needed than at Unilever where the storm hits you and you just can't move in any direction. So it's not going to be easy, but I think we'll be, uh, we'll be OK. Um, thank you very much. I think you shared great experiences with us. I've also heard that it's 
important for you that it's not that you guys are successful, but that you touch a lot of people and that they follow your success. So I kindly invite anyone who wants to know more <laughs> to contact you guys directly and uh, spread the good words. And, uh, and thank you, everyone, for your attention. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you.